This lecture is going to take us through the hormones of the adrenal cortex. Um, just a reminder of where the adrenal glands are located, just superior to the two kidneys. Um, we'll be looking more closely at these blood vessels. Uh, you'll recall I mentioned the celiac trunk with the celiac plexus back in the in chapter 15 uh, in the autonomic nervous system. So just kind of get your bearings as to where in the anatomy we're taking a look at. So we're looking at the adrenal cortex. We've already looked at the adrenal medulla. If you'll recall in chapter 15, that's where we get the epinephrine secretion and that linkage between the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. But we are looking then at the cells and the se uh, hormones secreted from the cortex. This slide here just shows the different zones or areas of uh, tissue in which the different hormones are secreted. I do require that you know these zones. Now you will not see a picture of this slide anywhere, so don't worry about trying to differentiate the different kinds of cells or tissues that make up the zones. However, you will need to know the zona glomerulosa secretes the mineral corticoids or the aldosterone, which is the main one that we look at up here. It's the first layer working from the outside in. Here's the capsule and the zona glomerulosa. The zona fasciculata is where the glucocorticoids or cortisol is secreted from. And then still within the cortex, the zona reticularis, reticularis is where the androgens are secreted from. So you have these three zones or three areas working from the outside deep through the adrenal cortex. And then, of course, in the adrenal medulla, the chromaffin cells are where it's primarily epinephrine. There is some norepinephrine, but it's primarily epi that you're going to be seeing secreted from here. So again, please know these three zones and what's being secreted from there, aldosterone in the glomerulosa, cortisol in the fasciculata, and androgens in the reticularis. Now, taking just a moment to look at cortisol secretion, I've listed out the actions. I'm going to go through those in just a second, but I'm also going to remind you of this image that we was earlier um, in the uh, in the chapter. We looked at the corticotropin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus, and the ACTH, the adrenal corticotropin hormone, that's going to be secreted from the anterior pituitary. That ACTH targets the adrenal cortex. Specifically, it's targeting the zona fasciculata. That's where cortisol is being secreted from. So targets the zona fasciculata to secrete cortisol or the glucocorticoids. As cortisol levels rise, it has a negative feedback, a double loop, both on ACTH and on the hypothalamus with the CRH, so that double feedback loop. Now, again, this was not one that was going to be one of the feedbacks on your exam, uh, but it's partly because it's so similar to thyroid hormone, except, of course, the gland is not the adrenal cortex. The, grand, the gland in that case for T3 and T4 is the, th uh, the follicular cells of the thyroid. But please be familiar with this process. Expect a question on the exam, maybe two, addressing this feedback mechanism and these hormones with regards to the secretion of cortisol. Now, back to the target. Cortisol targets many cells in the body, and its actions are listed here. It's a very important hormone, particularly when we get to immune response. But the actions of cortisol um, promote the breakdown of proteins, particularly in muscle fibers. What it does is it takes our muscles, breaks them down so that those amino acids, if you'll recall, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, those amino acids are then available to produce other uh, proteins, and it also get, releases energy when we break down, break down those proteins in order to make ATP. So if we have an energy need, cortisol can function to take energy from other substances instead of taking from the food we bring in. We can break down proteins within the body and also proteins within the digestive system which what, that we're bringing in. Um, and break those down. But it, again, particularly cortisol acts to break down muscle tissue. So it's really taking from us, uh, which may seem like a negative uh, thing, but don't think about it as constantly breaking down and destroying our muscle tissue, but we can pull from that reserve. Another thing that it does, and this is a very important term, this is the gluconeogenesis. Basically, it means to form glucose from something else. Genesis being to form new, something new, the genesis or the creation of something, to form glucose from other substances. Primarily, we're talking about taking lipids 
amino acids from the proteins, uh, lactic acids, and turning them into glucose. The liver is responsible for doing this. And that process of gluconeogenesis can be promoted by cortisol. So that's its function or its action to make, to make more glucose. It triggers the liver to do this. Again, gluconeogenesis to form glucose from new glucose from something else. Amino acids, proteins, lipids. It occurs in the liver and cortisol will trigger this action. Now, cortisol is not the only thing that will get the liver to do this, but that is one of the actions of cortisol. Lipolysis is another thing. Again, if we're going to use lipids to make new glucose, then cortisol also promotes the breakdown of lipids, the, particularly um, breaking triglycerides and fatty acids, yeah, release of triglycerides and fatty acids from our adipose tissue. So it has a good effect as well um, to take and break down those lipids uh, for energy source. It's involved in resistance to stress. Um, Mainly it does this by making more ATP av available. It also promotes vasoconstriction, which remember what we said in lecture, vasoconstriction will raise blood pressure. So if we need to deal, if we're in a stressful situation and the blood pressure needs to rise in order to meet the needs of the body, cortisol does play a role in that. So that's particularly important if you're in a stressful, again, stress doesn't always mean mental stress. It can mean stress on the body. So, for instance, if you're having blood loss, that's a stress on the body, in which case increasing the blood pressure will help make up for that blood loss. So, again, resistance to stress doesn't always mean just like I'm having a stressful day because I have an exam to study for, but it's the stress, the physio physiological stress on the body. And then cortisol, um, you may have heard of hydrocortisone, that's a form of cortisol, has very strong anti-inflammatory effects. But when you have something that's anti-inflammatory, what you're actually doing is depressing or inhibiting an immune system response. So inflammation is a normal process in the body, and we'll talk about inflammation more when we get into chapter uh, 21. 22, I believe it is in this, tech, in this textbook, when we look at the immune system um, and the lymphatic system, they're really the same system working together, um, we'll look at how inflammation works and the immune system works. And so cortisol has anti-inflammatory effects, reduces inflammation, which often is an overreaction of the body. Still normal, but can become an overreaction. So it's helpful in that sense, but it actually inhibits the use of white blood cells in the body, which actually depresses our ability to fight off infection. So it has a good and not so great effect. You don't want to overdo the cortisol. So those are the main actions then for cortisol. And again, we've already looked at this feedback loop. Don't forget the androgens are there from that zona reticularis. Uh, we don't really say too much about the androgens other than particularly in the female. This is where the uh, male hormones uh, are coming from, the androgens are coming from. Um, and of course the, the, the male prior to, pu prior to puberty um, gets his hormones um, primarily from the adrenal cortex. And of course we've already mentioned the epinephrine. All right. That takes us to the RAA pathway. Now, we've already gone over this in class, but I want to walk you through this one more time. And so let's take a, a beginning of this. Remember, the first three boxes that you see here are just setting the stage for what triggers this RAA pathway or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway. So if we have any kind of decrease in blood volume, decrease in blood pressure, and there are some examples of things that can do that at, at box number one, this will cause the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney to secrete or increase secretion of renin. Renin is always being secreted in lower or high levels depending upon the body needs. That renin enters the bloodstream and at the same time we have the liver producing the protein angiotensinogen. When angiotensinogen comes in contact with renin, it's an enzymatic action. Renin actually changes the shape and structure of angiotensinogen to form angiotensin 1. So there we are at step 7 already. Angiotensin 1, now flowing through the blood, enters into the blood vessels of the lungs. Just as the blood is circulating throughout the body, it will get to the lungs. As it passes through the capillaries of the lungs, it comes in contact with the enzyme ACE angiotensin-converting enzyme. 
Remember, ACE is fixed in the lung. It is not a free-floating enzyme that circulates around the body. It is only at lung tissue. When angiotensin 1 meets up with ACE, it forms angiotensin 2. Again, it's another enzymatic type of action that changes the structure of angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 2 is, in fact, a hormone. As you'll recall in lecture, I mentioned Please don't classify renin as a hormone. Your book is starting to do that. But for our purposes here in lecture, I want you to think of it as its action being solely that of an enzyme. Now, angiotensin II, though, is a hormone and has hormonal actions. It's made in the blood, and it's going to target two main things. It's going to target our blood vessels, our arterioles, and cause vasoconstriction. And in fact, it's one of the most powerful vasoconstrictors in the body. The angiotensin II also targets the adrenal cortex. The, remember back over here, it's up at the zona glomerulosa is where it's going to target where aldosterone is being produced. So the zona glomerulosa is targeted by angiotensin II, and we have an increase in aldosterone produ production. Aldosterone, remember, please try to remember this, aldosterone's... Uh, action or function is to target the kidneys to retain sodium don't put it out in the urine water will follow it and we will also excrete or get rid of and in this case it says secretion but it becomes waste the potassium and the hydrogen so we lose potassium and hydrogen we keep sodium water follows along that increases our blood volume which then increases our blood pressure and don't forget Aldosterone, although certainly triggered by angiotensin II, will cause its production, but aldosterone production will also occur when we have increased potassium in the extracellular fluid or in the bloodstream even. That triggers the adrenal cortex to start producing aldosterone. So that's your RAA pathway. Um, please try and keep that process in mind. Most, if, even if this isn't the diagram that you see on the exam or the, the flow chart you have to fill in, you can certainly expect at least 10 points worth of questions about this process to show up on your exam. And then this table here um, gives a summary of the hormones from the adrenal cortex and just kind of walks you through how the secretions are controlled and what are their principal actions. So it's merely just a summary slide.